Our head instructor, Dave Jackie, has written an essential two-volume information-packed book called Edible Forest Gardens with his co-author, Eric Tonensmaya. You can learn more about it and order it at ediblefortgardens.com. I know we've had some new people come in, so I just want to repeat one thing that I said earlier. And that this, what we're presenting are scenarios for Jenny's and Rob's place, partly as design exercises, and they may inform what Jenny and Rob actually do, but they're, but they're more theoretical than, than real. So don't get caught up that this is actually what's going to happen, please. <laughs> Don't want to get her in trouble. Just, again, uh, just as a side note, our maps are oriented the same as the last group. This is south along the road, north down here. So all of our overlays will be in that similar orientation. Um, with that said, we're uh, the Heartland Security Team. Eric Lang, Josh Herzer, uh, providing the food security the heartland of America. <laughs> um, as with the other groups, we went through the same process. Um, we had a different, a different uh, charge than they did, so this has affected our analysis in different ways. Um, our project was to develop a nursery um, with high genetic diversity for the community. Um, so as many plants as possible on Jenny's lot. Um, after interviewing Jenny, we developed sort of her goals and her vision and combined those with, with uh, the overall charge and that created a goal summary which Michael is going to explain to you. So our, our goal summary, as you can see, we're the Heartland Security Group and, and talking about the, uh, the nursery that is going to the community and I'll let you look over here. This site demonstrates diverse arrangements, gills, succession patterns, and species that are common to forest gardens. And secondly, a nursery provides the community with diverse forest garden plants not commonly available in this area and not commonly available in a lot of areas too. So uh, things that we've left. And thirdly, this site tests the productivity of various cultivars and species while providing for uh, Propagates, propagates of successful varieties for distribution. So we're looking at a, uh, a research uh, element in that as we're testing to determine what are the best uh, cultivars that grow in this area and then propagating them and storing them both on site and in the community. So as we look, as we consider what we're doing, uh, the, the site comes into play, of course. I mean, we, everyone knows, we've talked about a scale of, scale of permanence already. Uh, we're not in Alaska, so we have a certain climate here, and we don't change that very easily. So the, the climate is long, warm. We have a growing season with, with rain, as we see now. Uh, and I think this is Florida, is that right? <laughs> it rained every day, and then we'll go. Uh, but the slide is gently sloping, so we have a we have a little bit of a slope on, on the south end going on down, and a gradual slope. Uh, it's a oh, it's open. Uh, there's an it's an island. It's the site itself is an island in an ocean of traditional or conventional agriculture, industrial agriculture. That's why we're the Heartland Security Team. You know, bring food security back into our our. So the soil is another factor that we want to consider, and that's a silty clay loam soil with high organic matter. When you put your hand in there, you've got some good black dirt, and I wish I had some of that in, down in the Cincinnati area. Uh, we've got a high water table. We actually dug a three feet, three foot hole and found water there. That's amazing. You see a lot of crawl beds that are dug in and all around the space. That was un unique to me. It was. I thought we were in maybe um, New Orleans or something. <laughs> but then the, uh, the central area is sunny, and um, so here's our sun spot. We've got uh, a sunny, a sunny uh, patch, and then we're, um, we're, let's see, we have high organic matter, no, 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 a sunny patch, low, oh yeah, the, the vegetation is what we're gonna talk about here. 
So this is, it's, it's um, we don't have a whole lot of big trees here. And so we have mostly grass and short cultivars that are uh, young, young trees that are fruit, fruit trees, and then also some uh, berries and things like that on the edges of this sunny area. And then we have a, a perimeter area that's a high canopy. So this high canopy is a more mature forest type area. And of course, over here on the west, we have a much more uh, de developed forest of this. This is just a thin strip here. And so this is blocking a lot of the sun, and we have to deal with that. Uh, so we, we have uh, various plants that can grow here uh, that wouldn't grow in, in uh, this area very well with a lot of sun. So the perimeter is um, late succession. And then bisecting our whole site, we have a uh, leach field that has some gravel in it, of course. We've got uh, considerations for trees. We want to have trees going in there that will interfere with this leach field. And then we have a footpath also that is uh, bisecting our, our site. We're going to move on. Okay. So based on this analysis, we try to come up with a concept for the whole design. Um, so. Eric's going to take it away. So the basic concept for our design here is to build on the existing pattern. And as we see it, the existing pattern is a center area that's sunny and low and immature, and a perimeter area that's high canopy and mature trees. Uh, and shaded and so other colonies. So two major differences between the sunny low area and this uh, canopy high area. And so I'm breaking out these characteristics here and about our concept here. So on the perimeter, what our concept is is to take what's pretty much high mature trees and make it into a curved with a standard linear succession model, which is sort of the high mature things at one end and grass at the other end and gradual build up. And so we're looking at that model for this, except we're going to need to fill in with the mid-level uh, things to bring it that it's now curved instead of exactly linear. But it's called linear succession. And then for the center area, we're looking at an old field patch kind of structure um, to, to model the succession that's going on there. Um, so like I said, we add mid-level vegetation. Here we keep it at low level. The purpose for the outside perimeter is to be for food production for the people on the residents and for uh, long-term holding of genetic stock, whereas in the uh, center area, it's for propagation, taking things off site and keeping things uh, young because they're, you know, we're growing up. In the perimeter, it's going to be wild. This is the most wild area, so we're going to emphasize the wild aspect of the perimeter. And in the, in the center, we're going to have what's culture, greenhouse, other things related to propagation. So, and then for our concept for operation, uh, the management in the home area is going to be under Jenny and Rob's uh, management. But the rest of the area would be primarily the management would be from a separate farmer with uh, uh, the family support. Um, we're going to talk about um, making a clear entry point here. Um, this this area here, which we call the infrastructure block, is going to be a, is going to be a clear entry when you're coming to visit or when you've entered the garden. And then we're going to build on the uh, reorganize some of the depots, but then uh, emphasize this pathway over this other wide pathway for getting through things. Um, and our model for holding genetic uh, diversity is to do that through the community rather than trying to have everything living to hold our genetic stock on this property. We're going to expand it to the people who come in and take things in the community. Uh, so from these concepts and further we still get the idea down to the exact patches on um, where we want different trees. So yeah, so we're going to work with the different habitats and out along here, here except we've got these uh, tall trees. And it's basically going to be our showroom for how uh, a food forest is going to work and um, be more of a mimicking a natural forest. And so we're going to have like tall nut trees, and beneath that, we'll have uh, smaller uh, shade tolerant fruit trees. Um, it's just going to be an extension of our forest. Um, and then while those uh, nut, well, we planted the nut trees for late succession, um, while it's developing early on in its life, 
Uh, we'll have maybe some uh, trees for coppicing, uh, for fuel, or maybe making baskets or a fence. Um, and then out in here, we have like uh, shorter to mid-sized trees. And uh, we're working more in specific with gills in here. And so we're going to have um, fruit trees. And um, using those gills, we'll have dynamic accumulators to build the soil, um, nectarary plants to bring pollinators when those fruit trees are uh, pollen or flowering. And um, then we would have ground cover to kind of keep the weeds at bay. And, um, also, underneath the fruit tree, we would have the berry bushes and stuff to be for propagation to set up on site or for people who want um, any of those berries. And also, the trees would be used for uh, grafting, making cuttings, and giving those away as well. And um, then in here, uh, out in here, we kind of got like the old mosaic, old field mosaic. So it's going to be some shade trees and uh, some sunny spots for sun loving things. And then we decided to put a root cellar in here for uh, keeping maybe the cut of graft, cutting things for grafting. And um, yeah, just a lot of um, mid-succession things going on, uh, maybe some disturbance areas. And then in here is going to be the most intensely managed. This is the greenhouse for starting things. And um, this is our hugel culture, which um, would be things going out. The hugel culture is kind of like mounded. So um, since there is a high water table, we're going to if there's things that like uh, have dry feet, like to have uh, drier soil, we would plant them on the mounds. And one of our ideas was having pallets and kind of planting a guild on that pallet. Um, so it is self-sustaining uh, in the future. And then that would be kind of like a prepackaged permaculture to go. People um, can come things on the um, mound. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so with all this in mind, sort of our overall goals and uh, we need a variety, we need stuff for propagation, we got into sort of designing specific patches. Um, I took just, if you can imagine this patch, we've got the taller trees here, and we're starting to blend down into lower trees. Um, she has existing butternuts, so we know they grow there, so I chose this as, a, as an example. Um, when building a gill, you usually pick um, your central, like main producing tree and work around that. So, um, I analyzed butternut, first took down specific ideas about it. It's tap rooted, it likes full sun, it produces jug loam, which people talked about earlier. Um, some of its soil requirements are nitrogen, um, potassium, and whatever P stands for, phosphorus, thank you. Um, and it seldom has pest problems, so it's not something to worry about. Based on those ideas, I then looked for plants that were jug loam tolerant, first of all. Um, also plants that maybe could take some shade since it's going to have a big canopy um, and also something that could be propagated. Um, so I chose hazelnuts to go around it. Um, this sort of represents little patches of hazelnuts with uh, you got paths in here so you can harvest, you can get to the butternut um, and you can walk in to propagate. Uh, so the hazelnuts, their characteristics, they'll tolerate part, part shade they're flat rooted, um, so they won't compete with the butternut's tap root. So they sort of form uh, what's called a resource partitioning yield. Our head instructor, Dave Jackie, has written an essential two volume information packed book called Edible Forest Gardens with his co author, Eric Tonensmeyer. You can learn more about it and order it at edibleforestgardens.com.